Rodney Reliance Church, Pastor Ted here, and we are in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're going to continue in verse 1 uh, this morning. Let me pray, and we're going to jump right into it. Lord, we do pray, as always, as we come to your word, that you give us wisdom and discernment that we could comprehend what your word says, and that we could comprehend what it means, and that, Lord, you would help us not to be hearers only, but to be doers of your word by the power of your Holy Spirit. You promised, Lord, when you ascended into heaven that you would send your Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. Your word is truth. Your spirit empowers us to obey the truth, to put feet on our faith. And that's our prayer right now, Lord, as we come to your word, that you'd meet us here and that you, Lord, would speak to our hearts and empower us to put feet on our faith. And we ask it together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as we continue in 2 Thessalonians Church, I want you to keep in mind uh, that the backdrop is trial and hardship. Um, we have believers in the church of Thessalonica, and they are being persecuted. People are losing their jobs, they are losing their homes, their property is being seized. It is a time of great uncertainty uh, for that church, and into that environment, is spreading fake news and rumors. Sound familiar, right? Here they are going through. Rumors are spreading rampant in this church. Uh, and in particular, the false teachers are saying this. They're saying, hey, you guys, you're going through trial and tribulation, and it is clear that you have missed the rapture and that you are going through the great tribulation. And so Paul writes the 2 Thessalonians in order to counteract these lies, and he is spelling out primarily the, chrono the chronology of the last days. That's what Paul is addressing here. And specifically now, when we come to chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians, Paul addresses two key points. Number one, the timing of the last days, and number two, the task of the last days. And that's going to be our outline for our study today as we look at the first 12 chapters here of 2 Thessalonians. And let me just tell you right now why this is important to you. So often when we come to studying the Bible, the, the forefront question on hearers' minds is, what, how does this apply to me? Why, why should I care about this? And here's why you should care about this. Because, guys, we are living in the last days. Clearly, we're living in the last days. And as I say that, I want to first acknowledge uh, and address right up front that there are those who are numb to the things of prophecy. They are jaded to the things of prophecy. There are people that are skeptical uh, of last day's prophecies. And there's a lot of things that kind of contribute to that. Some of you may be jaded about the, the issues of, of prophecy uh, in Scripture because there has been no shortage of people who over the years have been sensationalizing end time prophecy. Others of you, maybe you're, you're numb or you're skeptical because, oh, for crying out loud, this is the Bible's talked about this and it's been 2,000 years that the church has been going on and, 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 you know, just hearing this over and over again. You know, for some, end times prophecy just seems like science fiction. It's funny, Brenda and I, we were just praying today. And, and as we were praying um, Brenda, in her prayer, was was just remarking to the Lord about how, you know, the end times prophecies so often can seem like science fiction. And, and when we were done with our time of praying, I, I, I spoke to her, I said, you know, Ben, um, it's true, it feels that way, but in, in a very large degree, isn't what we're going through right now, doesn't that feel like science fiction right now? Just the events of the last week. I mean, who would have thunk just in what's going on, uh, how rapidly it has come upon us, all of these things. And, you know, Peter, in his epistle, Second Peter, he addressed those who were skeptical um, about prophecy in his day. And he said this, he said, Second uh, Peter chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, he said, The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. But, he warns, the day of the Lord will come as 
as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. In other words, guys, we're living on borrowed time. Truly, we are. Armageddon is coming, um, and the delay that we've experienced for the last 2,000 years is nothing other than the love of God. The, the God of heaven loves you. He desires that none should perish, but that all should come to everlasting life. We live in an age of God's grace right now. And so let's look at the timeline and the task of these days that we're now living in. Let's hear what Paul has to say, and let's see how it applies to us right now. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, uh, verse 1. Now, brethren, he says, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to soon be shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Paul begins here by addressing the timing of the last days. And, and on this first point, Paul's going to focus on two separate times tables in this chapter. Uh, first of all, he's going to focus on the timing of the rapture of the church, and as well, he's going to focus on the timing of the Antichrist and of the tribulation. And here in verses 1 and 2, the focus is on the timing of the rapture of the church. The Bible says that the rapture of the church is an event that will happen suddenly. Here's what Paul said to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52. He said, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Paul sums up the impending rapture with a summary of, of what it involves. And he says here in verse 1 that it involves both the coming of Jesus Christ and also our gathering together to him. And, and really, this is, this is one and the same. Uh, I'll illustrate it this way. When, when, when I was a kid, my, my sister and I, we were down at the local school. We were playing. Um, it was the weekend. And we were playing on the school grounds. And there was a kid who cornered us, and he was tormenting us, and he actually, you know, basically kidnapped us, right? I mean, we were there. He didn't take us anywhere, but he was holding us at knife point, and he wasn't letting us leave. And, and, it, and we were terrified. I, w I was just a really little kid at this point. My sister, not much older, a couple years older than me. Well, my father at home, all of a sudden, he just he comes to this realization that we were in trouble. He had no way of knowing apart from the Lord, but the Lord spoke to his heart, and my father actually said to my mother at that point, the kids are in trouble, get in the car. And so they jumped in the car, and they raced down to the school, and my father at that point, he rescued us. And this is the picture here. Dad pulls up in, in his Jeep. He says, hey, get, get in the car, you know, and, and, and he rescues us. And then what does he do is he takes this kid who was tormenting us and begins to pour out his wrath. He takes him to his parents' house, actually, and, and they poured out their wrath. But this is the picture that we're looking at here when Paul says concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him it was just the same as my dad he shows up get in the car we he comes to us we gathered together to him this is the picture of the rapture of the church <coughs> and it is that sudden single event that can happen at any moment when Jesus comes for his church Paul described this event this way to the Thessalonians back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He said, uh, For the Lord himself will de descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. 
What Paul says is this. He says that when Jesus returns for his church, there will be two groups of people that he rescues. There are going to be those who have died in their faith, and there are going to be those who are living in their faith. And both of these groups together comprise the church. And Jesus has promised the church that he will come for us and that he will bring us to himself. He said to his disciples in John chapter 14, I will not leave you orphans, but I will come to you. He, he said in John chapter 14 verse 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And so for 2,000 years, Jesus has been building his church, generation after generation. And as believers die in faith, Jesus receives them unto himself, and at some point, at any moment, the church age is going to end. The last person is going to be saved, and that's when 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 that we've just read, that's when that event happens. Jesus comes and he gathers us together to himself. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he said, Let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever, and we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. And then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power, but, Paul says, thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he concludes with this thought. He says, so my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable, always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. And here's what that means for you and me today. Listen carefully. Not only does that give us a glorious hope for the future, and it does. It gives us that glorious hope for the future, but it also gives us, guys, peace in the present. Peace right now, which is exactly what Paul says in verse 2 of our text. He says there, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled in spirit. And that, the idea of that phrase, soon shaken in mind, it has to do with a sudden jolt. These are those trials that come upon us suddenly, totally out of the blue. Uh, when he says that we're not to be uh, troubled in spirit, the idea there, it, it, it speaks of a continuing state. And the idea is um, those trials that linger, those trials that keep you up at night, those trials that, that are your constant companion and that you're worried about. And certainly... Both of these things ring true for us, especially right now. A very sudden thing has come upon us. It is a thing that has lingered, that is keeping many awake and many stressing out. But Paul says here, don't let it shake you. Don't let it trouble you. Because God's plan for you and for me, not only hasn't it changed, but listen, God is working all things together for the good to those that love him and are the called according to his purpose. These are all part of God's plan. God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And so we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. Here's our application today, guys. We are right on time. Church, we are right on time. Jesus said in this world that we will face trials. And lately we've been reminded of that in a big way. Jesus said that we would see wars in various places and earthquakes in various places, that we would see famine and we would see pestilence in the days leading up to his return. And we have and we are. But listen, Jesus also said, now when these things begin to happen Look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. 
Here's my question for you today. Are you ready? Are you ready? If you're not, listen, here's why you need to be. Just as we've seen, Paul first addresses the timing of the last days, looking at the timing of the rapture of the church, which is what we just looked at. And then beginning in verse 3, Paul now deals with the second part of that. He deals with the timing of the Antichrist and of the coming tribulation. Notice with me, he says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, he's speaking of the day of, of the, the tribulation and the day ultimately of the second coming of Jesus Christ. He says that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. He's talking about the Antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The Antichrist, empowered by Satan, this has always been the desire of Satan to be worshipped as God, and this is how it's going to play off. And Paul says in verse 5, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things. And you guys will recall back in 1 Thessalonians, uh, we saw that Paul, he planted the church in Thessalonica. He was only with them for three weeks before he had to leave, but not until he'd established the church and raised up leaders in the church. And end times prophecy was so important to the Apostle Paul that even though he was only with this, this brand new church for only three weeks, he took the time to explain to them God's plan of the, the coming Antichrist, the rapture of the church, and all of these things. And so Paul says, uh, I, I, when I was still with you, I told you these things. Verse 6, and now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. He's saying that the Antichrist currently is being restrained. And Antichrist is being restrained by the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through his church. We'll come back to that and expand on that. But what Paul is saying there in verse 6 is that the, the, the Antichrist and the times of the Antichrist is being restrained by the present active working of the church in the world today with the, whole, the, the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit <coughs> and that he, speaking of Antichrist, will be revealed in his own time. In other words, this is not his time. It's coming up on his time, but right now this is not his time. Verse 7, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And again, he's speaking there of the Holy Spirit. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonder, and with all unrighteous deception, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Paul there is talking about all of those who reject Jesus Christ, all of those who will not be included in the rapture of the church. And so he's saying that there's going to be uh, those on the earth at that time who align with Antichrist. They reject the things of God. They embrace the things of Antichrist. And they don't receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Verse 11, and for this reason... God will send them strong delusions that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Listen, what Paul says is this. Paul says that there is a day coming very soon when there will be a great falling away. And the idea of that phrase falling away, it's very telling. Uh, it's that of a departure. And the, certainly right now we're seeing a progressive departure in our society away from the things of God to the things of evil. That's been happening and been, you know, in the world that's been a process for 2,000 years. And so there is a progressive departure that's happening. Um, but what Paul is alluding to 
And by the way, he, he says in verse 7, he makes allusion to that. He says, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. He's talking about that there is already a departure from the things of the faith in the earth. But what Paul is alluding to on a, on a larger scale, ultimately, the world is going to experience a very distinct departure. And that departure is going to be when Jesus shows up and says to his church, everybody out of the pool. Come on up here. When he raptures his church, guys, that is going to be when there is that rapid departure. The church is raptured. And then what will happen is that there will be a great apostasy. That word apostasy is that, that phrase falling away or that, that, the, the idea of that, the, that idea of us you know, progressively falling away from the Lord. Yeah, there's going to be a, a massive massive apostasy throughout the land and it'll be even worse than the days of the flood. Genesis chapter 6 we see the state of the world before the Lord flooded the the world. It tells us there in Genesis chapter 6 verses 5 through 8 <coughs> that the Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth and he saw that everything that they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. This is everybody on the face of the earth, uh, with one exception, which he'll, he'll note in verse 8. And verse 6 says, So the Lord was sorry that he'd ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, and I will destroy every living, th every living thing, all the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, and even the birds of the sky, I am sorry I ever made them. But, verse 8 tells us, Noah found favor with the Lord. And, of course, we know the story. God instructed Noah to build an ark. Noah and his family went into that ark. God sealed them in the ark. And when God poured out his wrath on a wicked world, he took out the remnant. By the way, this is an Old Testament picture of, of the rapture. Right? And the flood is an Old Testament picture of the wrath that is coming upon the earth uh, when, when God raptures his church, when God takes his church out of the way, and then ultimately when Antichrist and his followers rule and reign for a brief period of time. That's exactly what's coming to the earth. And very, uh, very clearly, um, just like God did with Noah and the flood in Genesis chapter 6, the same dynamic is going to happen with us. God says here, again, in verses 3 and 4, Let no one deceive you of any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. The church, uh, the church is, is departed from the world. The rest of the world distinctly falls into uh, hardcore apostasy. And the man of sin at that time will be revealed, the son of perdition. And what does he do? He opposes and he exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And so the day is coming soon. When the church is going to be raptured, and then what happens? At that time, Antichrist is going to be revealed. Now, I taught on this extensively in Revelation chapter 13 and in Daniel chapter 9, um, as well, <laughs> Revelation chapter 6. Um, and, uh, and they'll put those uh, links for you up in the comment section uh, there online. I would strongly encourage you to take the time and watch those messages. Purposely, what I'm trying to do in my messages here in our live stream, I'm trying to keep them on a shorter uh, time frame because of the constraints of you watching them with, with your family and all and your kids and, and so on. I'm being sensitive to that and, and being careful not, not to have the live stream go on too long. But these are important messages that if I had the time, I would take you through right now. So I'm doing the next best thing. I'm telling you, I've already preached on Revelation chapter 13. I've already preached on Daniel chapter 9. And I would have you listen to both of those messages. For that matter, you could listen to my entire Revelation series. I highly recommend it. But listen, the basic idea is this. In Daniel chapter 9, God gave Daniel a prophecy. This was thousands of years ago. This was hundreds of years before it actually took place. Most of this prophecy has already been fulfilled. 
And so God gave Daniel this prophecy. He gave him a detailed timeline of events that would be coming. And in this detailed timeline, God included very specific details of the first coming of Jesus Christ. Those were, not only were they fulfilled, they were filled precisely and to the day that God said they were going to happen. And, and this is so dramatic and so fascinating to consider that hundreds of years in advance, God would do this. God says in his word through the prophet Isaiah, who else, and I'm going to paraphrase, who else can tell you what's going to happen before it happens? Who else can tell you the future before it even happens? It's a rhetorical question because the answer is nobody, not even the National Enquirer psychics are going to get it right all the time, right? They might get one out of a thousand kind of remotely in the ballpark and everybody marvels and says, oh my gosh, look at that. They were right. God, 100% right. And it was so remarkable for historians to consider that, that it was was so accurate that there were those historians that would argue and say, well, Daniel was, wasn't written then, it was actually written later. Well, a couple of problems with that. One, Jesus referred uh, to the prophet Daniel in his own speaking, and two, uh, you, you might uh, have heard of a little thing called the Dead Sea Scrolls. They found these, these scrolls that were hidden in, in jars in the caves of Qumran, and they unearthed them, and they looked at them, and lo and behold, they found the writing of the prophet Daniel that authenticated that in fact these prophecies were given hundreds of years in advance before they ever came true and they did come true. Hundreds of prophecies about the first coming of Jesus Christ absolutely everyone fulfilled completely and totally. That is a mathematical impossibility by the way that that happened by random chance. And so uh, God gave Daniel these incredibly detailed uh, prophecies, including those incredible detailed timelines of Jesus' first coming. And then, through Jesus, God did something extraordinary. He hit the pause button on the end time clock, and the, the, the pause on this end time clock was when Jesus rose from the grave for our sins and ascended into heaven. And Jesus then established his church with orders that we should preach the gospel. And why did God do this? Because he loves you. Because he loves me. Because he desires that none should perish, but that all should come to everlasting life by placing their faith in the person and the work of Jesus. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that today. Before we're done, I'm going to pray and I'm going to give you an opportunity to cry out and ask the Lord to save you. Because here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that we are all sinners by nature and by choice. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And the Bible says that if we will confess to the Lord that we're sinners, that we will make a profession of faith that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the son of the living God, that God has raised him from the dead, if we believe that and we make that profession of faith and we give invitation to the Lord to save us, the Bible promises that he will save you. The Bible says if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become New. And so God loves you. But listen, God told Daniel, and Paul makes it clear here in 2 Thessalonians verse, chapter 2, verse 3, that after the rapture of the church, God is going to start that end times clock again. That there's going to be a seven-year period of time during which the Antichrist is going to be revealed and he will be hailed as the Messiah, and he will negotiate a world treaty. Um, everybody will see him as the answer to all the world's problems, and for the first few years, it's going to seem like, like this guy can do no wrong. But halfway through this treaty, three and a half years into it, he's going to break the treaty, and then literally all hell is going to break loose on this earth earth. And I would strongly encourage you to watch my message uh, uh, in, in uh, Revelation chapter 6. talks all about uh, this period of time uh, when uh, the seals in heaven are broken during that last three and a half years of the tribulation period. It's not going to be a pretty time on the earth. God gave the Apostle John this detailed vision uh, in Revelation 13, another message I'd have you listen to. And and. He's, he's very precise in that. It's very incredible to see what's happening, what's coming upon the earth. 
Well, that brings us to our second point, the task of the last days. We've, we've looked at the timing of the last days, the rapture of the church, and the timing of the coming Antichrist. Now let's look at the task of the last days, and I'll bring your attention back to verses 5 through 7. Paul says this, he says, Do you not remember that uh, um, when I was still with you, I told you these things? Verse 6, he says, And now you know what is restraining. It's the Holy Spirit working in his church. That's what's restrain, restraining the coming Antichrist right now. That he, the Antichrist, may be revealed in his own time after the church is raptured is the idea. Verse 7, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, right? The, we see uh, an apostasy in our world. We see a falling away from Jesus, which is just a foretaste of what's going to come when, when the restraining force, the Holy Spirit, working through the church and working through the believers in the world, when that is taking out of the world, when, when the Lord takes us out, then what he says is here, you know what is restraining, that he... Antichrist may be revealed in his own time, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he, who now restrains, speaking of the Holy Spirit, will do so until he is taken out of the way. The church is raptured, and then the green light is given for evilness to prevail on the earth. And then the lawless one will be revealed. The Antichrist will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his of his coming. Listen, the idea of our last point here is the task of the last days. And guys, here's what I say to you. All of this <coughs> is what's coming, right? Jesus said that there's going to be signs of, of these things leading up to the rapture of the church. And church, we have never been closer to the rapture of the church than we are right this second. But listen, the rapture hasn't happened yet. And so that means a couple of very important things. Listen, right now what we need to do is that we need to recognize that why we, while we are still here on this earth, while we still have breath in our lungs, while we, we still have the opportunity to proclaim the gospel and to be salt and light to a, to a, a thirsty world, Listen, we need to do all we can during this time to be filled with and led by the Holy Spirit of God. Now again, I did an entire message on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's in our value series and the moderators will put it up on, uh, on our YouTube and our, our Facebook uh, live feeds right now. And I would encourage you, again, take the time to listen to that message. But listen, it is so critically important that we operate in the power of of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've heard the story. There was a man who was flying from Honolulu to Los Angeles in a 747, and they were shortly into the flight when the pilot came on and told them that they had had an engine problem and they had to shut down one of the engines. And he assured the passengers, he said, listen, this is a 747, we have four engines, and so don't be, don't be too alarmed. We, we still have three engines. Uh, the only drawback is we're going to be a little delayed uh, getting into Los Angeles. And so, you know, some frayed nerves, but everybody just sort of settled into it. it. Well, a little while later, the pilot comes back on and he says, guys, We've lost a second engine, but again, I would encourage you, uh, we, we have two engines remaining. Uh, this, this plane could even fly on one engine if we have to, so, so we're all right, but we're going to be a little delayed more than even before getting into Los Angeles. And a short time later, the pilot comes back on and he says, well, folks, we've lost our third engine, but as I told you, we can fly on one engine. Again, we're going to have a significant delay getting into Los Angeles, but uh, guys, it's going to be all right. And at this point, this guy sitting in, the, in his seat, he turns to his seatmate. He says, man, I, I hope we don't lose that last engine. We're going to be up here all night, right? Now, a stupid story, right? But the, the fact of the matter is, um, you may not know it, but commercial planes actually have what they call a glide ratio. Um, and uh, a 747, even a plane th that is that big, 
uh, that weighs over 900,000 pounds, it also has a glide ratio. And the glide ratio uh, is uh, between 15 to 1 and 20 to 1. And what that means is that a 747 with no power at all, when, when it loses all its engines, it can still travel about 100 miles uh, be, before they have a catastrophic encounter with the earth. Now, some Christians have a glide ratio as well. That's what I want you to hear. You see, the church exists as a result of God working through his Holy Spirit. <clears throat> God poured out his Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, the day the church was born. And ever since that day, guys, the Holy Spirit has been working in and he's been working through the church. He's working in your life and he's working through your life. But without the power of the Holy Spirit, listen, you operate in glide mode. And guys, today, right now, is not the time for any of us to be operating in glide mode. In glide mode. Just, just operating on dying momentum. Hey, Elvis has left the building. That is no place to be. Pastor Chuck Smith, Chuck Smith said this. He said, without the Holy Spirit in its midst, the church is just a social club or a service organization, but when the Holy Spirit is given his proper place, the body of Christ becomes a dynamic force of change in a sick and tired world. Guys, Elvis isn't the only one that's left the building. Right now, the church has left the building right? You're, you're living proof of it right now. You're watching this at home. The church has left the building, but in this dark hour, it is up to you. It is up to me. It is up to all of us to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to let our light sh so shine before men that they will see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. Why? Listen, it all goes back to why we've been waiting for 2,000 years for God to rapture his church. The reason we're waiting is because God loves people. And listen, God wants to use you. Guys, now is the time. It is up to you and it is up to me because Jesus' return is closer than we've ever known it to be. And we need right now to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to be saying, Lord, here I am and you're doing something monumental in this world. This world has come to a grinding halt and it's worldwide and it is life-changing. It's life-altering. And what will this mean for the future? I don't know. But Lord, you're doing something. And right now, Christian, it's time for us to say, how can I glorify you, Lord? How can I be used by you, Lord? How can I respond for such a time as this? Listen, next week we're going to continue and finish up chapter 2. We're going to look at how to stand fast in this dark hour. We're going to look at how the truth of prophecy informs our actions in four very distinct ways. But right now, let me ask you this. Are you ready? Are you ready for the return of Jesus Christ? Listen, I'm going to pray and we're going to partake of communion in just a minute. But I want to ask you right now, those of you listening, do you know where you're going to spend eternity? Do you know that if Jesus were to return for his church right now, would he take you with him? Listen, you can know. You can know for certain where you're going to spend eternity. You can know that when you die, your sins are going to be forgiven. How? Listen, the Bible says if we confess our sins, that he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible says if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. And right now, wherever you are, I want to give you an invitation. You can invite Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior and to forgive you of your sins. And I would invite you right now, if that's you, just pray this prayer. Lord God, I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. And Jesus, I believe that you are the Savior. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin in my place. I believe that you uh, suffered, that you died, that you were buried. But I believe on the third day you rose again, that you conquered Satan and sin and death. And I believe you can rise me from the death as well. Lord, I cry out to you to come in and to cleanse me 
and to make me that new creation. Give me new desires. Help me to know you and help me to walk with you. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer, guys, we would love to encourage you. We'd love to help you along in your faith. And you can, you can reach out right now on, on, uh, the, the, on the, the online platforms. You can say, hey, I just prayed that prayer. And, uh, and we'll encourage you there. You can contact the, the church office. The phone number and the contact information will be put up uh, on our, all of our online forums. You can reach out to us. We would love to pray with you and encourage you in your newfound faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you.